the May 2015 NCFL Grand Nationals topic is going to be Resolved Corporate Influence in Education is Detrimental to Society. It is a very big topic that might be a lot smaller if it had a couple more words in it, but as it is, there is a ton to debate here. I'm going to start out with some of the things that make this different from a lot of the other tournaments you may have gone to over the years before qualifying. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the wording of the topic itself and the different ways that it is broad. Then about some ways to narrow it down, some common strategies for each team and some common temptations that each side is going to fall into. If you've been to NCFLs before, you might want to skip ahead three minutes right about now, but I'm going to talk about what makes this tournament different. First off, pro always speaks first, so is isn't the usual side check of if you get the side that you feel is weaker, you at least get to speak second. Second thing is there are five prelims back to back in a single day. This makes scouting difficult to impossible, and you have to have a case that can do pretty much whatever somebody might interpret the topic to mean, rather than adapting to what you heard teams say the previous day, or what you heard a judge say a team said a previous day, or anything like that. Speaks are less relevant at this tournament, both less relevant to you performance-wise in terms of what somebody might think is a 29, somebody else might think is a 22 for the same speech, and both think they're giving a very good score. Or, on the other hand, just the idea that they're less relevant to you from a competitive standpoint because they don't matter nearly as much for clearing. They are a tertiary tiebreaker rather than a secondary tiebreaker. So you get speaks per team, not speaks per debater. You do not get speaker awards. And speaks are only used if two teams that would clear have both the same win-loss record and the same total number of ballots, which is important because every preliminary round is judged by a panel of three judges. So for instance, you could be 5-0 with 15 ballots. You could be 5-0 with 10 ballots. Most 5-0 teams will be somewhere in between. For one teams could also have 10 ballots, they could have up to 11, they could have substantially lower than that. Generally speaking, at this tournament you will need to be 4-1 to clear, and a decent number of ballots is also going to be important. So that means that you not only need to win a round, you need to win all three judges in the round. At the same time, this means that you can't really adapt to any one judge too much or use the elimination round strategy of, well, I don't really care what this judge thinks and I'm going to win the other two because that third judge can still influence whether you clear or not. Another big difference is that sides are pre-assigned and locked. So at least one, you'll need to win at least one round on the weaker side of the topic to clear. You cannot just coin flip your way to victory here. You will have at least two rounds on each side of the topic, and again, you will need to win at least four rounds total. So those are some things to keep in mind about the tournament itself. The other thing, too, is with evidence. Teams will not be able to ask to see your articles. You do not have to give anybody any evidence. You should probably let them look at your case if they ask to, because if not, it looks kind of bad. And judges are not allowed to look at evidence either. This means that a lot of teams are going to overstate their evidence. Do not do that. All this means is that instead of the judge evaluating the evidence to decide whether it says what it does or not, it's the debate in the round on the evidence's reliability that matters more, and you can treat that just like any other debate, as long as it does not sidetrack you from the bigger picture that you are trying to use that evidence or the lack thereof to win. This also means that you care less about evidence that has rigorous methodology and more about evidence that makes confident sweeping statements. This means that generally speaking, you are looking towards books, you are looking towards think tanks, you are looking towards editorials, you are looking away from news articles, you are looking away from journal articles, not universally, but as a general trend on this topic. Also, recency matters much less on this topic because it is asking about a general principle rather than about a specific event, so older evidence is not a problem. Again, this leans us towards books and other advocacy platforms. All right, with that out of the way, let's look at what makes this topic so, so broad. First off, there's the broadness of corporate influence, because corporate does not just mean a for-profit publicly traded corporation. There are publicly traded corporations, there are privately owned corporations. An LLC is a corporation. A PAC is a corporation. 
A labor union is an incorporated entity. Many private schools are as well. Even as many public schools or charter schools are run in one way or another by a corporation. It might be a 501c3 not-for-profit corporation, but it is still a corporation. So at this point, corporations can mean anything from textbook companies to curriculum design to teacher recertification to pretty much any college out there. There will be some kind of corporation associated with it to teachers' unions. So there's so many different things that can fall into corporations. This is a list that could go on for the length of this video, but I'm going to simply move on from now and trust that if you're not sure that something counts as corporate influence or not, you can ask about it and I'll respond in the comments. So corporate influence is incredibly broad. Now let's look at education. It doesn't say primary education. It doesn't say secondary education. This could be preschools. This could be public schools, this could be private schools, this could be elementary schools, this could be high schools, this could be universities. We're talking about education. As a matter of fact, it doesn't need to be education for a degree. Job training is also education. And that takes us to society, because detrimental to society is the only impact on this topic, but it's a very hard one to quantify and a very hard one to weigh, if the topic is indeed weighable, which one team is probably going to dispute in many rounds. So when we are looking at the broadness of society, remember this topic is not parametricized to the United States. This topic is talking about society just about anywhere around the world. So you have to be able to show not just how it has helped or hurt the U.S. in terms of its economy, in terms of its politics, in terms of its scores relative to the rest of the world, you're talking about society as a whole. All right, so now that we understand how much fits into this topic, let's take a look at some of the issues with it. First off, it doesn't say on balance or more harm than good or any kind of other weighing mechanism built into the topic. This means the topic is fundamentally true unless there are zero examples. This means that many con teams are going to argue the topic should be debated as if it had the words on balance to make it fairer and to make it actually debatable. This also means that a con team needs to decide. Do we want to argue that it doesn't matter whether or not the topic is true, as long as we can also say, well, there's also good to go with the detriment? Or do they want to say, well, there are no instances where it is detrimental. It is always beneficial to society. And generally speaking, I think con teams want to do the former. I tend to steer teams away from framework at NCFLs, and I definitely would still steer you away from saying the word framework out loud at NCFLs. But at the same time, I think the risks of not arguing that on con greatly outweigh the risks of arguing it. So aside from that, the other thing that makes it hard to weigh is corporate influence is inevitable. There's going to be corporate influence in any kind of education you can find in any society at any level of education. It is just a question of the amount of the influence and the relative benefit or harm compared to other forms of corporate influence. And that's the other thing that makes this a little bit complex. Corporate influence does not go in a single direction. It works at cross purposes. For instance, there is corporate influence both to defund and to increase funding for public schools. There is corporate influence to switch to voucher programs and corporate influence to cancel voucher programs. Different corporations have different influences in mind. And the real question is who loses out from that? Remember, we are talking about education as an abstract entity. A team can win or lose this is good or bad for the students in education and still not win the round. So the temptation on pro is to point out that the resolution doesn't say on balance and we need one example to win the round. The drawback to this is it makes you look like you're trying to avoid debate rather than create debate. You are trying to not have to debate the other team. And this will leave a bad taste in a lot of judges' mouths, meaning even if you do win rounds on it, you will win them on two ones, which will probably hurt your odds of clearing significantly unless you go undefeated. The temptation on con is to argue that education in general is good. There will be no education without corporate influence. Education needs corporate influence to exist and just try to defend that education is good. The trouble with this is it doesn't answer the question of whether or not education would be better without. The third issue with this topic is just the literature gap. Nobody writes that corporate influence is good for education, except for corporations trying to influence education. 
there is going to be no evidence that even appears to be unbiased for the con side on this topic. So that's something that you have to be aware of. On the other hand, there's going to be bias in pretty much all the pro-evidence as well, but it's going to be much better disguised as a concerned parent, a concerned teacher, an objective study, when in actuality, the bias exists in both, but kind of has a much, much harder time hiding it, especially in rounds where the judge hears all of the evidence and sees none of the evidence. So let's look at some distinctions here. Influence in terms of whether it has a direction, just in terms of whether its presence is harmful. So this is something a comm might want to look at. They might want to say it's unweighable because this influence happens at cross purposes and it cancels itself out. And unless the pro side can show you that one kind of influence is substantially more than another kind of influence, they can't prove the resolution true and you have to negate. The pro response to this is typically going to be that even if some amount of influence is inevitable, and even if it is working at cross purposes, the mere fact that education is caught in the crossfire diverts resources away from actually improving education, improving society. Another distinction is just presence versus influence, like I alluded to a moment ago. So the fact that corporations are present in education when education is doing good things does not mean that it is because of that corporate influence. A lot of pro teams are going to say that con teams are giving examples of education where there are corporations present, but not where the influence itself is improving anything. With those distinctions, that takes us to a couple different ways to frame the round, a couple different ways to weigh the round. The biggest one is probably just what is the role of education in a society, or more specifically, what is the role of education in a democratic society? Because generally speaking, it's going to be an intuitive argument to most of the judge pool that not being democratic also harms society, so you can look at that in terms of how it leads to a more informed populace, how it helps civic engagement, how it helps with better voters, so on and so forth, and that anything that's harmful to education in terms of bias in it is in turn harmful to that society in the long term. Now, there's also more practical purposes to education as well. One can argue that education is important to make a society productive, to prepare society's members to be useful members of that society, to get people ready for the workforce. The question isn't whether education has one of these goals or not, it's which of these goals should take precedence versus which is, and whether or not corporate influence is affecting that. The other thing that factors into this as well is that a lot of times you will see con teams arguing that corporate influence is necessary because education cannot be funded without it because education funding has dropped. Aside from it not being true across societies in general, there's also the problem that the amount of funding that education has had given or cut is also largely a function of corporate influence rather than a need for it. So these twin purposes can exist in tandem. It's a question of which one should or shouldn't be looked at, whether this goal is or is not met, and if so, whether it is or is not because of corporate influence. Another way of looking at this topic as a whole is to kind of find a control group, to find an area that has more corporate influence or less corporate influence in other areas of education, or a society that uses more corporate influence in its education than other societies. Whether that's society in the past, in another part of the world, whichever, the idea that you can then look at that and say, when we control for corporate influence, this is what happens to education systems with more, this is what happens to ones with less, we can use that to gauge its effect on society, and any of our opponents' evidence that doesn't use this kind of comparative approach should not be evaluated in this round. Another way to look at it is a slight tweak on the more common two worlds approach. The judge should be voting for whether a world with more corporate influence in education or a world with less corporate influence in education would have a more or less desirable society. So. Long story short, if the words on balance aren't added to the resolution, pro probably wins most, ra most rounds. If they aren't added, the resolution is still very difficult to meaningfully weigh, even if it's only talking about the USA or only about the present, which it's not. It's a huge topic, 
And since Khan always goes second to NCFLs, it's a topic that Khan gets to pick which parts they want to debate after they hear what pros case isn't about. Smart teams are going to have multiple con cases to run in different circumstances, are probably going to prep before the first con speech instead of the second. Smart teams are going to have a pro case that can cover a wide variety of the topic with far reaching points that you can give examples of in different parts of the world, in different times of history, and with different amounts of corporate influence and different types of corporate influence. Good luck on the topic. If you have any specific questions, feel free to leave them in the comments and I will try to get around to them.